Excellent. Okay. Um, so you can see me and you can, uh, you can see the screen, which I think is probably the most important thing. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be able to introduce this program. Um, so this program is uh, a new master's program that we're, we're starting here at UCL uh, Biochemical Engineering. Um, I am the program director, so my name is Dr. Kasim Rafiq. And for me, this is probably one of the most exciting things I think we're looking to do moving forward, given the amount of interest there has been from industry about this particular program, uh, but also I think filling a need that has been you know, well documented, well established by both clinical partners, industry stakeholders, and even uh, governments globally. So I think we're very excited that we're able to offer this program. Um, it's very uh, timely, very pertinent, uh, and we think we are going to be, I think from, our, from my perspective, really developing the next generation of leaders within the sector. Well, that's the aim uh, at the very least. So I'd like to kick things off formally. So as, as Kim mentioned earlier, this webinar um, and this uh, virtual open day is being recorded. So if you do miss anything, uh, there is the opportunity to view the recording afterwards. Uh, we'll try to take as many questions as we can and happy to answer all of your questions about the program. If there's anything I'm not or can't answer at this stage, we can definitely follow up offline as well. Uh, and feel free to get in contact uh, by email after the webinar if you have any further questions. So, um, the program itself and the title is probably one of the longest titles for an MSc program, but I think I'd like to start with that. So the specific title for the MSc is the Manufacture and Commercialization of Stem Cell and Gene Therapies. And it's been specifically worded uh, with that in mind, because what we want to make absolutely clear is that um, there will be a significant focus on the manufacturing aspects, where there is a major industry need, and, and we'll come on to that, but also on the commercialization aspects. How do we get these therapies from uh, the lab discovery phase through to patients who actually need them and actually make them commercially viable for companies to actually uh, benefit and, and generate more products moving forward. So it's been specifically worded with that in mind and we focused on stem cell and gene therapies. There are other terms now being used in the industry, so things like advanced therapies, regenerative to medicines and so on and so forth. But stem cell and gene therapies are the two most common uh, therapeutic modalities within the sector. Uh, and ones that we know students, when they're searching for things, will be looking to, to go into. So, um, why this program? Um, so this is a slide I like to show in all of my research presentations when I'm going to conferences. But it's, for me, the fundamental need about why this program has been set up. So, Commissioner Gottlieb of the Food and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Regulator for Medicines, um, Commissioner Gottlieb, or the recently resigned Commissioner Gottlieb, who was uh, the Commissioner for the FDA, gave a speech uh, in May of last year where he identified that there were major challenges for the cell and gene therapy industry. So, namely, that the what he described as the greater challenge being the limitation. In, man, in manufacturing capability for cell and gene therapies, and also highlighting specifically that we have to consider developing scalable manufacturing processes that retain the inherent quality attributes. And when the, when the commissioner of the FDA, the, one of the major global regulators for therapeutics, identifies these as major, major challenges, then you know they are major challenges. And, and, and the regulators in this sector have been very supportive of enabling these therapies to reach the market, but even they've identified that actually the biggest issues at the moment are around the manufacture. This has been further reiterated uh, through various reports that have come out. So this is a report uh, by the uh, MMIP, the Medicine Manufacturing Industry Partnership, uh, which is a UK organization, lobbying organization, uh, for the biomanufacturing sector. Um, and they identified in their Advanced Therapies Manufacturing Action Plan that there was a major critical skills shortage that limits, in this case, the UK, the UK organization, that limits the UK's ability to capture significant market share 
in the uh, in the boom of cell and gene therapies. Uh, and so one of the things uh, that we felt was very important is that by increasing the skills pool at an earlier entry point, because mostly, you know, most of the graduates go in with a PhD or a higher doctorate, but actually there's a fundamental need to get individuals who come in at an earlier entry point that can address some of the skills shortages within the sector. And so therefore, we felt that establishing a, a master's course or an MSc course in the sector would be very important to address the critical skills shortage that we currently see. So why stem cell and gene therapy? Um, you know, what's exciting about them? You know, what's made them uh, very important to not just the UK government, but to governments globally? So one of the key things is that as we start to look at uh, an aging nation, um, so we're realizing that globally uh, society is living longer. So we're no longer living till our 60s and 70s. We're now li living till our 80s and 90s. And there's been some research to suggest that in the next 20 or 30 years, we will have the highest number of, uh, of citizens who are aged 100 and beyond. So as we start to live longer, the question really is how do we not just increase quantity of life, but how do we maintain the quality of life? How do we not just say, well, we're living longer, but actually our life is our, our life uh, quality is getting worse. How do we maintain the quality as we increase the quantity? And the real opportunity that people have identified is actually we need, therefore, new medicines to be able to address some of the issues associated with chronic aging and disease, so things like addressing Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, and other uh, chronic conditions. But also, this is a great opportunity to develop what not just a health, but also wealth uh, for, in, in this case, the UK PLC, but also global PLC. And so many of the developed nations, such as the US, the UK, certainly in parts of China and Japan and so on and so forth, they're focusing heavily on what is the next stage of medicines? What are the next medicines going to be? You know, we don't just want to treat the underlying symptoms with certain conditions, we want to cure them. And with the potential of stem cells, with the potential of regenerative medicines, and certainly gene therapies, we can start to think about curing some of these conditions. So that's kind of the background to you know, the, the opportunity of these therapies. But there's also the fact that actually these therapies are very expensive, uh, those that have been approved, and they are very difficult to manufacture. So although we've proven the science in some cases, the manufacturing process can be very challenging indeed. And here's an example of that. So these are four approved products. Uh, so maybe you might be familiar with Glibera, which was given the, uh, the, 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 the nickname or the tag of being the million dollar drug. Uh, that was a gene therapy that is no longer available because no one could afford it. Uh, but these are products which have been approved by the regulator, but you can see from the costs, they're not feasible from a, from a, from a commercial standpoint. And um, there's very few individuals who can privately pay for these therapies. Uh, when you consider that you know, some of these therapies are more expensive than houses in, in some cases in parts of London or, or the UK and so on. But also the fact that uh, for reimbursement agencies, so organizations like the NHS or NICE in particular who reimburse and pay for these therapies, or in the case of a, of, of a private healthcare system such as the US, insurance companies can't afford to treat patients with these types of therapies. It's just not economically feasible to be able to treat patients with these therapies because you know, they're, they're very expensive indeed. And their expense is, limited, is directly associated with their manufacture. So the question we're trying to address is, how can we reduce the cost of these therapies? And, and I think the other key factor is how do we increase global accessibility? So it's not just the developed nations that benefit from these types of therapies, but globally, patients across the world can benefit from these types of therapies. So, Hopefully you won't have the chance to, to watch the video. If not, as Kim has said, that we can, we can share the link and the link is available at the bottom of the slide there. Um, and I would suggest that you do watch it because for me it highlights why we do what we do and the fundamental driving force for why we set up this program and why we want to deliver what we want to deliver. Because when you see the transformational impact of some of these therapies that we can start to say for certain types of cancer, we think we are developing very much a cure. 
that was a condition of Emily Whitehead, who had her comeback, her, her cancer comeback on multiple occasions. They tried chemotherapy, uh, on a multiple rounds of chemotherapy, and it was failing to work. She'd had a bone marrow transplant, it failed to work, and there were no other clinical treatment options available to Emily. And had she not had this at the time, this, um, this clinical trial, being involved in this clinical trial for the CAR T therapy, she would have passed away of her condition. And yet she still lives to this day, fully healthy, uh, with no sign of the cancer returning, which for me is remarkable. We've never been in that situation in my lifetime, certainly, where we can see actually there's potential cures for some of these debilitating, chronic, or life-threatening conditions. And for me, I think that's such an amazing opportunity, particularly when you think this has the impact to change not just lives of the patients, but lives of those around them. And, you know, in this instance, you know, children who can now potentially live until they're 70, 80 and, and beyond potentially. Um, so for me, it's the remarkable impact that the work we're doing can have. And fundamentally, it's for me now, the science is proven, but we need to show we can manufacture and not just give it to one or two patients, but hopefully deliver this to all the patients, like these 10,000, 100,000 and beyond. So just like to, I always show this to my undergraduates, I show the video and then I show them this slide next. So this is Emily Whitehead a few years afterwards, and this was taken about three years ago, just before uh, President Barack Obama um, stepped down as president. Um, and for me, I like to show this because it shows the, um, the mindset of Emily. So uh, Emily was invited to attend uh, and meet with the president uh, of the United States at the time. And when she was asked by the president, is there anything I can do for you? Her response was, my school don't know I'm here today uh, visiting you. So if you could just write a quick note to let them know I was with you and I wasn't just missing school, uh, that would be much appreciated. And I think it just goes to highlight her character and resolve and, and it goes to show why we're doing what we're doing. So kind of that's the, the background to the program, why we've set it up. And then I want to go into some of the detail about the program itself. So the program, as I mentioned, um, it has a huge amount of industry support uh, and, and there's a huge industry driver, but also the government have identified you know, advanced therapies as being a major uh, opportunity for growth, both from a health perspective, but also from an economic perspective. And we were very fortunate that we were provided funding to actually set up this program. So uh, the government office at the time, the Higher Education Funding Council of England, which has now since been renamed as the Office for Students, uh, provided us with a grant to actually set up this program and, and employ the relevant staff members, but also start generating the content. So we're very, we're very grateful to uh, the Office for Students for providing us with the funding, but it highlights that actually it's a major government initiative and strategy to start to build skills in this area. So it goes back to that need uh, to de develop the right uh, skill set in this space. Uh, we've now had the program approved by UCL Program Module Approval Panel, PMAP, uh, and we will begin taking our first intake to start in September 2020. So the application is now open, um, but the intake will start, or the, the program will officially start in September 2020. The other point to mention, it won't apply to people who are looking to start next year, but it will be for future cohorts, is that this is one of the programs that has been designated uh, and because of the potential it has and so on, that when UCL opens its new campus in East London on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, this is one of the programs that will move fully into the brand new uh, state-of-the-art research facilities and, and teaching facilities at UCL East, which is expected to be around 2022 to 2023. So what is the program vision? For me, the vision is ultimately, it's a one-year program, full-time program, um, but it's to develop the next generation of engineers, scientists, and business professionals with that translational mindset to see how we can get these therapies from the lab to the clinic. And for me, it's often where the big gap is. There's lots of master's programs, which, or PhD programs, or education programs, which focuses on the science and the biology. And there's lots of programs which focus on the clinical aspects um, and how we get this, you know, how we actually physically give this to patients or looking at patient responses. But the big gap is in between, you know, how do we translate the science and get it from treating maybe a handful of patients 
to actually being able to say we can now develop a product, we can manufacture the product, and we can now deliver this to 10,000 patients. And some of these therapies, as you've seen with Emily Whitehead, CAR T therapy, it's a personalized treatment, which is a very different manufacturing paradigm from most other therapies. You know, we're looking at developing for each and every patient. So each patient, we're taking their cells, manipulating their cells uh, in the lab, and then delivering it back to that same patient. So it's a personalized patient-specific type of therapy. And that provides a very complex manufacturing and cost challenge, which we need to try and address. So we feel that there's a major gap where there aren't enough trained professionals, either from the engineering background, from the scientific background, and indeed from the business and commercial background, who have these skills and can think about how we can scale up and manufacture and commercialize these therapies. And it's really aimed at enabling, enhancing, and empowering what we feel are the two types of complementary future leaders. We want to develop leaders who are either scientific and manufacturing leaders, or, or complementary to that, the scientific technology and the business leaders uh, who will deliver this space. Because what we're finding is it's not just the scientific or the manufacturing knowledge, but actually sometimes it's difficult to really appreciate, you know, what are the business challenges? What are the business models? If we're looking at a patient-specific therapy, you price that and you cost that very differently to a therapy that you're going to be delivering to 10,000 patients from the same source. So what are the, you know, what are the different pricing strategies? How do we look at things like reimbursement? Who is going to pay, be able to pay for this? What are the different pricing structures? I mean, it's very interesting now when you look at the industry, companies who have developed some of those therapies, so Kimaya and Yescarta, which are two approved CAR T therapy products, the, in, the companies are now looking at novel pricing strategies. So there's been discussion around, you know, do we start to charge uh, patients or, or com insurance companies or government agencies on a money back guarantee type approach, whereby if patients haven't achieved full remission within a set number of years, then they will only pay for, you know, half of the therapy rather than the full therapy. So it does require multiple skill sets. And what we're trying to do is develop individuals that have that breadth of knowledge but also have their depth in whether it's the manufacturing whether it's the commercial or the scientific aspects and i think the other key thing within all of this is that it has to be industry-led we are specifically trying to address an industry need and make sure that our graduates who come out from this program are designed to go into industry they don't all have to it doesn't mean that if you do this you have to go into industry you can't do research no no much of our research is actually very industry aligned, which I'll come on to. But one of the key things is that we want the content to make sure it's absolutely relevant. So you get the, you know, the case studies that are happening as we speak, as these therapies, I mean, the field is constantly changing. Every other day, there's a, a new merger or acquisition, or there's a company you know, announcing clinical trial results, or you know, there's, a, there's a major breakthrough, and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that this is very much industry led, um, and that the content is aligned to meet the skills of what industry would expect and to ensure that there's both industrial and clinical relevance. So I'll come on to um, the input and the impact of the steering committee and introduce uh, the steering committee members as well. But also we want to produce, as I mentioned, graduates that are both industry ready, but also those graduates that can affect organizational change. You know, we want our graduates to be the leaders of the industry. And much of how we will teach and what we will cover is designed exactly to do that. We don't just want to generate graduates who will go into a company and you know, will do a standard scientific R&D type role. That might be what some of our graduates do, but what we're really trying to do is develop the graduates with that mindset, with that ability, and with that passion to go into companies and start to think about how they can transform, change, perhaps even develop graduates who are focused on entrepreneurship and, and have that, the managerial skills to be able to lead projects, move things forward, and so on, and really establish a strong global academic and industrial network. And we've got various ways we intend to do that. So just to give you an idea of the program structures, again, we designed this specifically in mind that we wanted all of the content to be absolutely brand new. So just to clarify, there will be no modules that will be sharing from other programs. All of these modules, and there's six compulsory modules, that are designed specifically for this program. We didn't want this program to kind of say, well, okay, we'll take a bit of, you know, uh, 
you know, that program there, we'll take one of the modules from there. And, and here we thought if we're going to do this and give it justice, all of the modules have to be absolutely brand new. They have to be specifically designed for this program. And we, we, we decided we didn't want any option modules because we felt that with option modules at this stage of, of your studies, if you're looking at going into the sector, you know what you want to do. You want to go into manufacturing commercialization. If this isn't for you, fair enough. I mean, you don't have to do it, but we felt that if, if we were starting to offer option modules, it wouldn't necessarily fit what we wanted to achieve. So working with our industry partners and, and so on, we identified that these would be the key modules that they felt students would be would need to have a background in to, to address the industry need. So one of the biggest modules is a, a module that I'll be leading, which is um, the advanced therapy manufacturing model, a module which is a 45 credit module that splits over term one and term two. That goes in depth into the manufacturing and the technologies that we will be using. There's module two, which will be focusing specifically on the aspects of commercialization, regulation, and the ethics of advanced therapies. Uh, module three focuses on, on the preclinical and clinical trial uh, information and data, and specifically what types of things do you need to do to go through a clinical trial with the advanced therapy sector in mind. Module four is specifically focused on, you know, it's one of the modules where we felt that there's always changes in the science, there's always changes in the technologies. Um, and we want to make sure that you're getting the up-to-date latest information year in, year out. In five years' time, I think the program might be different because obviously the, the field would have changed. And this is the module that we really want to capture those differences. Some things will be very much the same, but some things will be very different in five years' time. You just I think last week, uh, there was a brand new paper looking at a new way of doing gene editing, which has now got the whole field very excited. So that's the type of module where all of those up-to-date breaking bits of science and, and technology will be covered. And then the final two modules are really to provide you with the laboratory and the research skill sets in order to be able to deliver uh, meaningful scientific manufacturing or commercial outcomes. So in module five, which takes place in, in the first term, you'll cover the key aspects of research skills. So things like um, getting into the lab. So we have dedicated weeks where you'll be culturing or growing T cells or stem cells or doing some of the actual analytical techniques of flow cytometry or PCR and, and you'll be doing them yourself. Um, so actually working in the lab and spending significant periods of time uh, in that module within the lab, but also um, learning some of the other key research skills, so things like statistics, things like um, uh, you know how to prepare and construct literature reviews and so on and so forth. So key research skills, both the uh, practical and the non-practical research skills. And then finally, in terms two and three, and this kind of the, leads us to the end of the, the program, is the advanced therapy research project. So what we'd like to do is, is guarantee that every student who takes the program uh, can, if they want to, do a lab-based research project. Uh, we realize some students may not want to do a lab-based research project, they might want to do a cost of goods or a modeling project, which might be computer-based, and that's something we can also uh, offer as well. But if every student wants to do a lab-based project, we will commit to offering every student a lab-based project. Um, and those projects will be focusing on things like manufacturing of T-cells or CAR-T or CAR-NK or, or stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, or whatever it might be, and then all of the associated analytical techniques associated with that. What I'm not going to do today is go into each module in detail and kind of say these are the assessments and, and so on and so forth. All of that information will come out uh, and will be available on the website and, and so on uh, over time. And, and there's information, I believe, at the moment as well, and uh, that kind of breaks down the percentages of, uh, of each module in terms of assessment and so on. But for me, I, I want to attract students who aren't worried about the assessment, but actually what they're going to learn. The assessments for me are, for me, uh, an afterthought in the sense that, you know, we want students who are not here just to get the degree, but actually want to learn this knowledge and actually get involved in it. And the assessments will assess those learning outcomes. But for me, I think we want to make sure that the students are engaged throughout the course of the program itself. So just to kind of go through some of the, the key information that some of you might have questions around with respect to entry requirements. So we do require a minimum of an upper second class bachelor's degree with honors in a relevant subject. And we've kind of kept the relevant subjects broad. So everything from the life sciences, biotechnology, bioengineering, uh, things like chemistry um, and so on and so forth, as well as other engineering topics, whether it be mechanical, chemical, and so on. Um, right the way through to you know, a business uh, undergraduate, but that 
has a bio life tech component. Um, so this would be from a UK university or an equivalent uh, approved overseas university. Um, so again, if you're not if you're not sure if your um, entry requirements uh, uh, fit with that, uh, or if, if your background fits with that, do check with UCL admissions. They will um, be able to answer any questions with regards to that. Um, we also are opening this up to candidates who have uh, industrial experience. So you may not have a 2-1, but you may have a significant amount of relevant industrial experience, and you're also encouraged to apply. Again, we're trying to train up the industry, and that's something we're very keen uh, to encourage to, to have that. So if you are coming from the industrial experience route, we do require a minimum of a lower second class bachelor's degree uh, from a UK or equivalent uh, approved overseas institution. Uh, and the postgraduate industrial experience would have to demonstrate a minimum of two years within the last five years uh, in a role involving something like bioprocessing, bioengineering, chemical engineering, and so on. There is an English language requirement. So if, you, if your education hasn't been conducted in English, uh, we do require you that you demonstrate evidence of adequate a level of English proficiency and for this program that is established as being good and there are criteria as to what that involves. So again, UCL admissions uh, and UCL information about that can be found on various websites. Uh, the final things, and this is really what I'm focusing on when I start to review the applications that come in for this program is firstly, the personal statement. The personal statement for me is very important. Why is it you want to do this program and why you? You know, what is it about this program that excites you, that interests you? What are your motivations? Because for me, this program, I'm really looking to try and encourage a particular cohort of individuals who are passionate, enthusiastic, motivated, and are very keen to do this. And so I, I'm, I'm really keen to see what are your uh, interests in, 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 in undertaking this program, how much you know about the field, and so on and so forth. And then, as, as you would expect with any program or job, whatever it might be, two references from people who are able to comment on your uh, suitability for the program itself. So what is the teaching style and the, uh, the industrial alignment? So on the teaching style, so firstly, there will be a mix of styles. So firstly, there will be a, a focus on traditional teaching styles. So that will involve certainly lots of case-based, case study-based learning. So we're gonna go through uh, both manufacturing case studies of where things have worked and where things haven't worked in various companies and, and various industries. Some of it will have to be anonymized because obviously it can't always, um, some companies will let us share their experiences but won't let us talk about their particular products and so on. But the fact that you get real life case studies, which is one of the key things that we want to be able to deliver, but also go through things like Harvard Business Review papers, actually going through case studies of businesses within the biotech sector and how they've traversed and how they've either succeeded or failed and outcomes and learnings from that. There will be clearly you know, lectures and seminars which are fundamental I think to any university-based teaching, but there will also be a significant amount of practical and laboratory-based teaching. So you'll be in the lab learning various techniques, learning how to undertake uh, various um, assays or practicals or, or cell culture, whatever it might be. Clearly there'll be tutorials where we'll go through perhaps papers and scientific papers and papers that companies have published and and then they're talking about their clinical outcomes or whatever it might be. Lots of group discussions. So for me, I think this is one of the most important ways of learning is learning from others and learning from your peers, not just the academics or the in industry experts, but also from your, your colleagues on the program itself. So learning from each other. That I think will also come through in the flipped learning uh, sessions. And also for me, I think which is very important, lots of videos and webinars. Uh, we've got lots of exciting ideas uh, as we go on various trips, as, as you'll see, uh, we've got lots of videos lined up as we go on our journeys to kind of teach you and learn about different things. So I think there's lots to be learned from various videos and webinars, as we'll come into in a second. I'll explain what, what those will involve. So that's our traditional teaching style. But as you'll see on the other side, we've got lots of what I call real world teaching. So one of the key things is that um, if for one of the assessments, for example, but for me, it's less about the assessment and more about the experience and the practice and what you will develop from it is we will have the, uh, the, um, the students undergo a dragon's den environment. So we're gonna get real venture capitalists, uh, real people who have invested in companies to actually uh, go through a dragon's den process. So in term two, for one of the modules, you'll spend a couple of months with a group, with your group developing a business study and business plan. And then you will, at the end of that process, 
have to deliver a dragon's den pitch. So you probably have 10 to 20 minutes uh, in front of the dragon where you have to deliver your business model and business plan and they will be brutal and we want them to be in a, in a kind way, obviously. Um, but we want them to be, we want them to kind of put you on the spot and question your finances, question your business model, question uh, uh, your, your approach and your strategy because that's what the real world is like. And you'll be doing, if you're going to the sector and you get involved in business development and so on, you'll be doing a lot of that. So that's one of the key things uh, that we want that, that, for example, be part of the real world teaching and experience. There will also be an MBA style teaching approach where there'll be lots of networking sessions. Uh, we want to encourage advanced managerial and entrepreneurial skills. So there'll be lots of opportunities for you to develop your entrepreneurial skill set. But lots of networking sessions there will be you know, at various points throughout the program going to companies or uh, having industry join us. We'll be having, uh, as you'll see a bit later, industry and alumni dinners as the program moves forward. Uh, but every year there'll be at least one major dinner where we'll have lots of industry speakers for a networking session, maybe an evening reception, uh, a dinner and so on, where you will get to network, meet with them, have dinner with them, uh, hear from them, but also present to them. Uh, that will be one of the other key things. Um, lots of industry and clinical visits. We've committed to at least three industry and or clinical visits, which I'll come into in a second. And that, again, is part of the assessment. So we have to deliver it. And we want our students to go to companies, to go to clinical hospital sites, and actually see what life is like in the real world. You can't learn everything from UCL from the classroom. You have to see these things up front and in person and understand, okay, but if I'm designing a manufacturing process, this is the type of facility it will need to go into, or these are the challenges that other companies have faced. One of the other key things is we're going to be using some software uh, which we're purchasing specifically for this program called Labster. I'll go into a bit more detail, but effectively it provides a virtual laboratory environment. So even though we'll be doing actually lots of practical hands-on things in real life, there will also you will always have access to throughout the course of the program this virtual laboratory activity, which is fantastic. And it, it's helped students in a number of ways that we've tested this on and we've had access to this, who've benefited immensely from having access to Labster. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Labster, it's a Netflix style uh, application. So you can, you can work on an iPad, you can work on a computer, you can work on any device that has access to the internet. Um, and it allows you, it's like a game. So you, so you can actually take on different laboratory exercises, fermentation, PCR, they've got hundreds. So you can choose which one you want. And then you can actually go through and run a virtual laboratory experiment, generate data, analyze that data. It's a fantastic learning experience. Uh, and clearly a very safe environment, as long as you are operating your computer safely. Um, but it's a fantastic opportunity for students to learn some of the key laboratory techniques theoretically and see certain things happen visually before we then get into the lab and you actually do these things in real life. So I mentioned briefly the industry and alumni dinner, so I won't go into that in any more detail. But coffee morning sessions with experts. So this is for me, I think, very, very important. So I've committed to at least once every two weeks and myself or colleagues who are teaching on the program or indeed industry colleagues that will be joining us to have a coffee morning session where every two weeks we'll catch up, we'll go to one of the local coffee shops, either at UCL or outside, and, and we will cover the cost of the coffee, so don't worry. Um, but we will actually, and it doesn't have to be coffee, it could have tea or water, whatever, you, whatever you'd prefer. Um, but the idea is that we all catch up regularly as a cohort and discuss you know, what, are ha what is happening in the industry What's the latest breaking news? You know, what's, what's happening on the program? You know, are there any, is there any feedback you'd like to provide us with? Um, but also, you know, just catching up with all of the students regularly, for me, is going to be very important, which is why I want to be very selective about who we have coming onto the program, because I wanted to make it absolutely a cohort, a team, because although you will do very different things afterwards, I want in 20 years' time, the graduates from this cohort, to still be in contact with one another. And you, one might be at one company, one might be at another company, but you might have solutions for each other. You might be collaborating with each other, which believe it or not, happens in real life. People who, that I have graduated with from my PhD, I now have active collaborations with, and one of them's actually on our advisory board or steering committee. So these are lifelong relationships that we want to develop and inculcate. And we want everyone to, by the end of this, you know, we want everyone to, there will be a strong bond between all of the cohorts. As I mentioned, there'll be various meetings with venture capitalists and key opinion leaders, and we want them to be brutally honest and give, them, give us their war story. So you know, when they were growing up or when they went through undergraduate, when they went into their first company or when they led their first merger and acquisition, you know, what was it like? You know, don't just tell us the good things, 
what went wrong, what, what happened, you know, tell us the real kind of warts and all. So kind of what are their real stories? And the steering committee have, have, have committed to that. And they've said we want to train the next generation and we want to tell them not just about the successes, but actually all the failures, all the hard work that went into getting that acquisition across the line or getting that product onto the market or where something failed a clinical trial. And they want to share those stories. And that leads on to the final thing. So all of the steering committee members, and we have 10, have all committed to an AMA. For those of you that are familiar with AMA, I think this is started on Reddit. Um, this is what's known as an ask me anything. Um, and they've all committed to a one hour, at least one hour, a webinar or in person where you can ask them absolutely anything. So questions about salary, questions about working conditions, questions about their personal profile, whatever you can think of. And they've all committed to, to you know, individually all doing an AMA. So that would be fantastic. I, I'm imagining one a month where we, you know, either online in a webinar or in person, uh, we'll be able to sit down with them and ask them absolutely anything. And I'll be, I, you know, I've got a few questions myself, but uh, I'll leave it to the students to, to ask the, the important and critical questions. And for me, all of this is designed fundamentally with this in mind that we want to create leaders of the future for this sector. So going then specifically onto the company and site visits. Uh, so as I said, we'll have a minimum of three industry or clinical site visits during the program. There'll be no additional cost uh, to the students. Uh, so we will cover all the cost of transport and, and so on and so forth. And below kind of in those uh, logos there is, is an indicative list of the companies we will be visiting uh, or, or may visit. Um, so I've mentioned these companies, we have active collaborations with all the companies that are there and many more, uh, but also some of these companies are represented on our steering committee uh, and they've all committed to arranging site visits. So it may be that different years you might go to different companies, but what we're trying to do is get a broad representation of various companies. The other key thing at UCL, and I'll come on to when we go to my UCL, is that we, UCL has the largest biomedical research activity across Europe. We have seven hospitals, which UCL is affiliated with or connected to, uh, and the largest ATMP activity, as you'll see in one of the slides a bit later. So we'll actually look to visit hospitals at UCL where patients are receiving these therapies as we speak. But also, the other key thing is we want to get out of this mindset that our industry, cell and gene therapy, or ATMP, or biotech, is the only difficult manufacturing industry. There are industries out there, such as the automotive industry, where they are manufacturing high-value products, such as automobiles and cars, with absolute precision and with automated robotic capability. And that's one of the other things that we want to learn from other industries. So one of the things, again, we talk about the site visits, I myself have been on a tour of Jaguar Land Rover and I've seen their robotic platform, the manufacturing engines and cars up front and, 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 and in person. And I found that an extremely valuable experience, even though I have no intention of manufacturing cars. But actually some of the lessons and insights I picked up on that visit about their attention to detail, the quality inspections, the precision manufacturing, the technologies they were using, I thought was extremely relevant to cell and gene therapy and medicine manufacture. So that will be something that we look to commit to is actually taking you to a non-biotech industry visit, but also attending various conferences. Um, so again, we have a partnership with the World Advanced Therapies and Regenerative Medicine Congress. So we'd look to take our students to actual scientific and manufacturing conferences, but also even a conference such as Advanced Engineering, um, which is a national conference, which focuses not just on cell and gene, but on engineering and manufacturing across all high value sectors. So satellite production, automobile production, um, production of, uh, of, of uh, um, planes, aviation, and so on and so forth, but also biotech. So looking at uh, engineering and manufacturing in those industries as well and seeing what the latest breaking thing is in those sectors. So I've mentioned our industry steering committee a few times. Uh, so as you'll see from this list, we have some of the, the best individuals within the sector who are committed to ensuring that this program is industrially, clinically, and commercially relevant. Uh, so these are literally the best. And, and the thing that pleases me the most is this was my first choice kind of lineup of, of, of individuals uh, that I wanted to approach. Every single one of them said yes immediately. Uh, there was no hesitation. Said, Look, we want to be involved. Just let us know what's involved and, and, and we'll do it. Because every single one of these individuals, not only experts in their field, but they all individually have contributed in a meaningful way into the activity, but they're also very keen employers. I mean, they, they, the reason, one of the reasons I know they said yes is because they want to take the best and the brightest 
that graduate from this program and look to attract them to their various companies. Uh, so we're delighted to have, you know, I won't go through each and every one of them. Uh, we'll do that, but they'll all meet with you uh, if you do decide to take on the program uh, at some point. And so you'll get the chance to meet with them individually. But we feel that we've got a fantastic array of experts who will truly be contributing to the success of this program. And we actually have one of our major meetings in a couple of weeks time, uh, and they'll be doing some filming with us uh, for the promotional activity of the program. But the specific part of their visit is to sit down and actually help us prepare the content uh, for September 2020. So they're all actively engaged, all very excited, and will be, this information is public now. Uh, we'll be launching it publicly on the website and so on, uh, I think probably sometime next week. So you've got heads up as to who's going to be on our steering committee before everyone else. I mentioned briefly about Labster. Again, I've got a, I won't show the video, but there's a video link there if you'd like to see this in action. But just to give you some perspective, I, I mentioned that we're, we're signing this up and all students on this program will have access, complete access to, to Labster, again, at no additional cost, where they've, they've got hundreds of different experiments and protocols and things that you can run, everything from fermentation to running PCR to, you know, they, I think they've even got a crime, crime scene investigation analysis where you have to find out who the murderer is based on a PCR essay and, and whatever else it might be. But it's really educational, but at the same time, allows you to start to understand the principles of some of the analytical or uh, practical technique that we'll be doing. And you'll have access to this from the from day one of the program right the way through to the end of the program so you know if you want to work midnight at, you know you've got nothing else to do by all means you can jump onto labster and start doing some practical work and so on as well and finally i'd like to kind of wrap up with why ucl for this particular master's program so i think this graph probably highlights why ucl and um, what this graph is showing or what these graphs are showing are the advanced therapy medicinal products so the atmps or the cell and gene therapy clinical trials taking place globally and within the UK. So UCL is running more clinical trials in the advanced therapy space than every other university in the UK combined. So UCL, and, and this data is up to 2017, it's probably slightly more uh, now. Uh, and, and we know that the UCL Translational Research Office are collecting new data to confirm that. The other way I like to kind of perhaps suggest this is that UCL is running more clinical trials as a university than Italy and Netherlands combined, um, which I think is just a huge, um, I think it gives you a huge amount of confidence, the amount of work that's taking place at UCL and the amount of opportunity that's happening clinically. So it's, it, we feel it's a place to be for this particular sector, which is why we thought we had to get this manufacturing and commercialization course set up immediately because you know, we've got such a huge opportunity and getting our graduates engaged with clinicians and those that are doing these clinical trials will be absolutely critical. The other perhaps key reason as to why UCL as well is just the amount of academic clinical excellence. Um, you know, we have manufacturing sites within the, uh, within the university itself, a core biomanufacturing and bioprocessing expertise within the department. And UCL Hospital and Great Ormond Street Hospital, gosh, are the UK leading sectors for delivering of engineered T-cell therapies. Um, there's a huge amount of success of so FIH stands for first in human. So UCL was the first in human gene therapy uh, was done at UCL, for ADA SCID for various uh, therapies and so on. But also very importantly, look at all the, the logos down at the bottom. Those are all the spin out companies that UCL has developed, which majority of them are now leading this space. So you look at Autolis, you look at Mirror, you look at Orchard Therapeutics. Those are the companies that are now leading the manufacture and developing the products of the future um, and have generated IPOs of hundreds of millions. So these are phenomenal companies that UCL has uh, spun out and we still actively engage with them from a research perspective. The other key thing is, I mean, from a news perspective, so this is kind of highlighting personalized CAR-T therapy at UCL. So this is a BBC News article from the 20th of June this year, where a patient received a CAR-T therapy. That was work that was done at UCL. Um, this highlights, this article highlights how UCL and UCL Hospital is second in the world, only behind University of Pennsylvania, and the number one in Europe for CAR-T research activity. And some of you may have seen the BBC Two documentary, War in the Blood, uh, about a patient's journey receiving CAR-T therapies, which was all done at UCL. If you haven't seen the documentary, I highly recommend that you do go and watch it. It's a very emotive 
and it shows again, highlights why we do what we do. I'd like to wrap up on, on, on a couple of things. So the other key thing within the department is that we actually have a manufacturing hub targeted or focused on future targeted healthcare. This is a 10 million pound research investment, uh, which has all of those companies that you can see at the bottom involved. So the 35 different company and government organizations involved and a significant proportion of the work I lead up in terms of the research focuses specifically on personalized patient specific advanced cell and gene therapies. Uh, and so that research, which we're, again, is state of the art and is novel and is industry leading or clinically leading, is being filtered into and will be filtered into our master's program. So you'll get access to all of the key research that is happening in the sector. The other key thing, and this was kind of gives you an idea of the research approach, I think, so I won't go into any, any detail when I do a research presentation, this is what I tend to focus on, but this gives you an idea of the kind of things that we're looking at. So we have a whole bioprocess approach and we focus on everything from cell isolation, processing and manufacture, right the way through to cost of goods, reimbursement and regulation. And we focus on all of the key cell types and all the viral vector uh, and gene delivery uh, modalities, everything from adherent stem cells, uh, such as mesenchymal and so on, through to suspension stem cells, um, such as hematopoietic stem cells, right the way through to the lymphocytes, the T cells and NK cells and, and so on and so forth. So finally, uh, on the last couple of slides, but I won't go through this in any detail, is UCL today and why UCL specifically. So we sit within the Faculty of Engineering, which is the second largest recipient of UK research, EPSRC Research Council funding. Um, and we have demonstrated the most impactful engineering faculty in Europe. Uh, the department specifically uh, is the first founding and only uh, department focused on biochemical engineering. It's uh, and 90% of our research is classified as either world leading or internationally excellent by an independent uh, body. And we've got access to a whole range of facilities, uh, but also leading research activity. I mentioned the activity that we have through the hub, which is a 10 million pound investment. We also have significant numbers of research students who are sponsored through various grants and so on. And we have a significant amount of industry alignment and activity as well. This just gives you an idea about the investment in our facility. So we have well in excess of about 30 to 40 million pounds of investment within our research facilities, which students will have access to in the laboratory practical and also in the research project as well. And also kind of gives you an idea of some of the key funding. So we've had 10 million pounds from the EPSRC for the Manufacturing in the Future Hub. Uh, we've also received 14 million pounds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look at vaccine production and separately a vaccine manufacturing hub. So as a department, we are certainly research active, as you can see from the amounts of funding we're able to generate. Uh, but more importantly, I think that research feeds back into our teaching. And so we're making sure our graduates know what's happening at the very cutting edge of the research and what, we'll, you know, what they may be working on in the future, either from an industry or from an academic perspective. So finally, on to employability. Um, so clearly we've designed this to make our students as employable as possible and we know that they're very much in high demand. Uh, so potential roles include senior scientific R&D manufacturing management positions and given that you will be exposed through industry to, throughout the program right the way from day one through to the end uh, you will have the opportunity to develop your own professional network and you will have a significant industry exposure. Um, so obviously you haven't started the program, so you don't have any graduates from the program, but from our undergraduate and our PhD programs, since 2017, as an example, in this sector, we've had a number of our students who've gone on to companies like Autolus, GSK, Mira Therapeutics, Cell and Gene Therapy, Catapult, uh, all with a cell and gene therapy or stem cell and gene therapy background uh, as well. And we also feel that many of our graduates, if they want to stay on with us, we'd be delighted uh, to continue to do a PhD or an engineering doctorate if that was feasible. So we feel that the program will give you the necessary skills, training, and, and sector-specific information to succeed in the field. You will learn core concepts that aren't taught in many other programs, if any at all, about GMP, good manufacturing practice, and how this applies to commercial and clinical requirements. Um, and we want to make sure that you are industry ready, so that you have a, an understanding of what industry need and want, but also you can slot in seamlessly. You don't need huge amounts of training when you go to a company. And, and you will, that will hopefully put you in a more competitive position as we start to move forward in the sector. 
So with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and now that if we can't answer all the questions today, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions either via email or we can follow up with further discussions as well. So over to you. So I can see that there is a question already, which and perhaps I'll start with that question. Uh, and then if you do have any other questions, uh, by all means, do uh, send your questions um, across as well. So we have a question from David uh, about the students who are on the Bioprocess Company Medicine program, which is offered here at UCL. Do the modules build on the knowledge obtained in years two and three? It's a very good question. And yes, it absolutely does. So I mentioned that we're developing all new modules. Uh, so there won't be, you know, if you've done the Bioprocess Company Medicine program here at UCL, you won't be learning the same material. It will be built, it will fundamentally be building on that knowledge uh, and taking it into more depth uh, and giving you more breadth uh, as well. But obviously students may have, and this actually perhaps raises another question, students, you know, have, you know we're not going to take all our undergraduates from UCL, but we will have many uh, applicants who come from, come from other universities. Um, how do we make sure everyone's on kind of the same page when we start? One of the things I forgot to mention actually, which I think is very useful, is before the program starts, uh, we will actually give all students, and uh, not just UCL students or non-UCL students, but all students, before they start, once they've kind of applied and been offered a place and, uh, and, and have you know, paid the deposit, whatever it might be, um, so kind of in the summer period before the program starts, all students will have access to specifically created material that we've developed for online access. So you'll have access to online webinars and so on that have been pre-recorded, and um, that will teach you the fundamentals of things like what is a gene therapy, what is a cell therapy, what are basic manufacturing technologies. So that everyone comes in with some level of kind of equivalence at the beginning. Uh, so clearly some of the UCL students uh, may come in with a certain <coughs> advantage or certain amount of knowledge, but everyone hopefully will be at roughly the same sort of uh, position by the time we start because you will have access to that pre-course material which you can cover. Uh, in your own pace and at your own time. Uh, so there's a question here from Christiana, which says, can the research project be performed in a pharma or biotech company? Excellent question. The, the short answer is yes. And that's one of the things we're discussing now with some of the companies that we're collaborating with is how we can, um, how we can uh, look to collaborate with them and get some of these research projects either aligned to companies or actually done in at the companies. Uh, so we can't commit to that yet. So we can't say absolutely yes. But that is something that we're always working toward. Uh, clearly, if it's of interest to some students, we're going to continue to push that. Um, and that is something that the companies have actually demonstrated a lot of interest in, is actually can we have these projects aligned to some of the work we're doing. Whether that project takes place here at UCL, but is aligned to company objectives, or whether that takes place in the company, is still yet to be decided, but it's something that we, we're working on. We're working on both options as well but it will depend sometimes it's the confidentiality issues uh, sometimes is, is a major factor but that is something we are uh, very much looking uh, to try and uh, secure <coughs> Excuse me. so again if you have any other questions i'm still more than happy to answer any questions if you have them um hopefully i haven't bored you all uh, with that information but hopefully you, you find this program very exciting i mean for for us, it genuinely is going to be very innovative, very novel. We want this to be very different to, you know, the master's programs that are currently being offered. We feel that there's nothing being offered in this space at all, you know, on the manufacturing commercialization. We feel this is unique and we want to make sure that we are generating a, a cohort of graduates that are industry ready, that, you know, you're not just kind of coming from an academic background and so on, but that industry want to employ and will be competitively placed. So there's a question here from Pierre. Uh, would the MSc being very industry focused, would this make uh, pursuing a PhD after this any less likely? Or could I continue, could I envisage continuing with a PhD at UCL in the same field as the stem cells, APMPs? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, from my perspective, although it is very industry aligned, all of the research we do is very industry aligned. Um, so I talked about the manufacturing hub, 10 million pounds. Uh, we have, I think, 15 postdocs involved in that. We have about 10 aligned PhD students. Um, much of our research is focused on the translational aspect. So all of my research group, for example, so I have 12 PhD students at the moment and four postdocs. All of my researchers either have a company or a, a clinical collaborator. 
So it's all very industry aligned. If you, so a master's shouldn't, uh, the master shouldn't make you kind of more, you know, industry only. And certainly if you want to continue to do a PhD or MD here at UCL, uh, you'd be more than welcome. Clearly it's, it's competitive, but you know, we'd be, we'd be very keen and you have clear insight, information, knowledge about the activity here at UCL. Uh, and it's and it's an area that we're always looking to expand. So we have a huge amount of research activity, as you've seen, and we're continuing to build on that. So I don't know if there's any further questions. I realise we are we we are at the hour. Um, so I realise that some of you may have to uh, attend uh, other things. But if there aren't any further questions, like I said, I'm more than happy to answer any questions by email. My contact details are there. Um, so do feel free to reach out via email. Um, if you'd like to, at some point, potentially come and visit UCL, you're more than welcome to. Do give us some notice that we can arrange someone to give you a tour of the facilities. Uh, but by all means, do get in touch if you have any further questions. And I look forward to uh, you know, receiving applications if, if the program's of interest. There is actually one final question uh, here. Do you envisage any interactions with legislators during the course, as from experience, legislators are often behind industry on matters such as ATMP. Absolutely. So, legislators, specifically regu the regulatory body, so the MHRA, the uh, the EMA, and the FDA. Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there's a whole module dedicated to regulation, uh, and that one of our, if you notice from one of our steering committee members, I won't click that. One of our steering committee members, he's actually not a scientist or an engineer or a manufacturer. He's he's a lawyer, and his speciality of law is in policy and legislation for the advanced therapy sector and so on. So we will have experts like that on the program as well. So for me, it goes back to that fundamental point. This isn't your traditional kind of undergraduate master's program. We will want to bring in some of the legal policy and regulatory aspects. So we feel that's fundamental to the knowledge of the students in addition to things like manufacturing. So I think we'll leave it there. Um, so if you do have any further questions, um, by all means, do drop me an email. As Kim has mentioned in the chat, this recording will be available online afterwards, so you can go back and watch it any time. And do feel free to reach out if you'd like to have any further questions answered. But thank you very much, and I look forward to receiving the applications. Thank you.